Before the Rings of Power, there were the Silmarils. Before Sauron, there was his master, Morgoth. Before Aragorn and Arwen, there was Beren and Luthien. Welcome to Window on the West, where we explore all the ages of Tolkien's Middle-earth. With your hosts, Jonathan Watson, Michael Grumbine, and Dan Coates. Welcome to episode 22 of Window on the West. My name is Jonathan Watson. I'm here along with my co-leaders, co-hosts, group project guys for uh, Michael Grumbine down south right there and Dan Coates over to my left. And can um, I say, if, if we're a, if this is a group project, you're the one that does all the work and we get the grade. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting the final notes together for the professor. You're giving me all the good info. Mm. Yeah. That's very kind of you. Yeah, thanks. But yes. I'm, I'm, like the, I'm like the kid in the group project that didn't do much. You know, I just kind of sat back and he comes let, in. At let, the I end. let the smart kids do everything else. We, we make you give the presentation at the end. Oh, okay. you that's right. You that's right. You can, you can stand up and say things. I hated group projects. Oh, my gosh. It was the worst. That's why I got a literature degree. That was literally one of the reasons because I didn't, there were no group projects. I didn't have to like, <laughs> it was either essay tests or papers, and I didn't have to rely on anybody else. Hmm. And I hated there you go. Them. Anyway, we are on to the second half of chapter 17 of the coming of men into the West. Um, but hey, it's the end of the year. So one, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for what a great year. We started this podcast, I think it was in May, early May or late April. Sounds right. I don't even remember now. Um, but you know, we just had a few listeners, few, few listeners and a few followers. And now we've got a few thousand listeners to each episode. And mm. um, we're approaching 11,000 subscribers on YouTube. Uh, a few dozen patrons, a couple dozen patrons supporting us too, which is nice. And, uh, and yeah, so what a year. Who knows? Who knows what next year will, will be? Even, I've even started Torque Daily, which is um, just short little videos that uh, I'm calling your sometimes daily dose of Tolkien. You know, only a couple minutes long each, but something that you can kind of gnaw on and get annoyed by or uh, just ignore. Or maybe I've got something good to say. I just throw it all out there. Who knows? Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. But if you go to theonering.com slash daily, you can, uh, you can go straight to that playlist on YouTube. So it's theonering.com slash daily. Um, so thanks. What a year, guys. It's nice if you, if you build it, they will come. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, not a bad start for first year. No, no. We're, we're excited. I mean, I guess we have, the, <laughs> we have the rings of power to thank for some of it because no one liked it and everyone was interested in how much people didn't like it. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, some, some but, channels are still getting a lot of mileage out of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're still making a lot of a lot of weird approaches to how they're going to make season <laughs> the two. Latest, just... The latest one I saw was like they're insisting, no, no, we made a lot of money. Really, really. No, we don't have the receipts, but we made a lot of money. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> there were tons of people watching it. Lots. I mean, it was like we three sw- quarters of a ton well, in the first half, but then nobody watching. It. Yeah. So. We swear. Yeah. Tons of people. Love so, it. So if you want more people talking, you can become a patron, too. You can hear us talk more about this in our extended podcast, which are about 20 to 30 minutes longer than... The usual one. Um, and this week we're going to be talking about, uh, well, if you have any thoughts on the Tolkien biopic, which, which will be interesting because I, I haven't seen it. We'll talk about what you guys have seen not, or not. Uh, Naya has a question about where did the men of Rohan descend from? Since we're talking about men, hmm. where did these guys come from? And uh, Dan, because he couldn't put it down, finished the Silmarillion over Christmas. Oh, man. And so we're going to get your initial thoughts on finishing the entire book now. So it's so good. I just couldn't put it down. Once you get past all those F and elves, it starts to pick up. (laughs) Yeah, we have no more. Fingolfin dies in the next in the next chapter. So we've got one down. Feanor's gone. Fingolfin's down. Finway don't have to worry about. We're really down to Finarfin and Fingon and a couple others at that point. It's kind of it's kind of like a roller coaster. Like you get up to that very top of that peak, and then it just (laughs) it's just it's just all. Because, like, you have chapter after chapter where it's like, here's the fifth battle. Here's the ruin of Doriath. Here's yeah. the... Hey, we'll save it all yeah. for the, we'll save save it. It all we'll for save the extended it. podcast yeah. so these freeloaders can't listen to it without joining right. us. And you can join us in our Discord, too, if you become a patron. And uh, we have conversations there. We, uh, our All that is gold does not glitter comes from there again. Lynn did it this time. So, um, yeah. So did I, did I hear properly that this episode is going to be chapters 17 through 36 that we're reviewing, <laughs> apparently, to the <laughs> end of the book? Uh, Dan, you're just going to have to pretend you haven't read the end of the book when you go to those, right, those right. chapters. Yeah. So go to theonering.com slash patron, and you can uh, become a member there. It's $4 a month. The first month is free, and you get the extended podcast. You get access to Discord. 
and uh, we'll also we're trying to do a uh, a chat this week, an in person Discord video chat, so we can all chit chat about what we got for Christmas, and uh, who got the coolest Tolkien stuff. So hey, when when is this? Uh, we're looking at Sunday night, since Alrighty. everybody's got Monday off. Um, that would work, but uh, that, right. that was the first step. But yeah, so we'll do it. Do that. Join us thewinningcom slash patron. So we are going to head into all that is gold does not glitter. Uh, and this, as I said, comes from Lynn, which is good because we don't know. None of us know the answers to this. So I haven't looked at the answers in Discord. Um, and uh, and we will see if we know the answers. So, all right. So we're going to go to number one, which is, then the warm summer was followed by a hard winter. It was bitter cold in the mountains and food was scarce. The talk got louder. Hmm. Lowland sheep and kind from the deep pastures were much discussed. We'll go to number two now. Often he took to the rim ice that was beginning to form, and more than once he crashed through and struggled for life in the icy current. Hmm. Let me read that a little better. Often he took to the rim ice that was beginning to form, and more than once he c crashed through and struggled for life in the icy current. Hmm. Okay, number three. The tiny branch-framed patch of sky that could be seen from the mouth of the cave was often obscured, cast over with heavy snow-laden clouds. All right, we'll do number four. And this is, uh, this is, uh, this is a meter, actually, this is not just prose. Um, and the stars falling cold, and the smell of hay in the snow, and the far owl, warning among the folds and the frozen hold, flocked with the sheep white smoke of the farmhouse cowl in the river-wended vales where the tale was told. That one's hard to say. Hmm. Um, so let me go back to the first one, which is then the warm summer was followed by a hard winter. It was bitter cold in the mountains and food was scarce. The talk got louder. Lowland sheep and kind from the deep pastures were much discussed. Um, so this is a winter theme we got going on in these quotes yeah, then. Yeah. A lot of ice and snow. A lot of ice and snow. <clears throat> okay. Okay, I don't, I, okay, for, so I have no clue at all. This doesn't ring any bells hmm. for me. Uh, well, well I, I don't, this one does not feel like Tolkien's writing to me. Um, but I could be wrong. Uh, it feels a little bit um, clipped, a little bit abrupt, which isn't his style. Yeah, that sentence, the talk got louder. That doesn't scream Tolkien to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put out number one. I don't know what you guys think, but uh, this is the second one. Often he took to the rim ice that was beginning to form, and more than once he crashed through and struggled for life in the icy current. Um, any thoughts on this one? I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember if I can... I mean, Tolkien is big on his descriptions of landscape. And so I'm trying to remember if he's used the word rim ice before. Also, hmm. there's something about the content of this that's interesting to me. I don't know that it's Tolkien because what that's... kind of what kind of creature can keep struggling and crashing through and and, and swimming for life in icy current um, with snow? I mean, it doesn't sound human. Which makes me this think was it might... the the snow troll that Gladriel fought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this feels uh, like it's not a human creature yeah. that's doing this, and so I don't know if this would be Tolkien or not. But anyway, yeah, yeah. I, yeah I'm leaning that's, against. I, I'm leaning I, against this one. I would say, like stylistically, it's something he could have written. It doesn't seem like it's like so far out that I, I wouldn't say no, he right. didn't. But right. Um, right. I'm not sure otherwise. All right. Number three, the tiny branch framed patch of sky that could be seen from the mouth of the cave was often obscured, cast over with heavy snow laden clouds. Now, the word snow laden to me is very something along the lines Tolkien would, would have written. Um, branch framed patch of sky that could be seen from the mouth of the cave was often obscured, cast over. So now this is the only, okay, so this is this, the only thing that I would say like I, I don't know it, it could be could it be from um children of hurin right that's the right. It, has, thing it, it has a much more detailed narrative style than than his usual i mean we are reading 
we're in the middle of reading the Silmarillion, and I'm in the middle of reading my kids, as is my want, the 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 Lord of the Rings, and so mm-hmm. is. I could see this being Tolkien, yeah, but I don't. I don't recognize it. No, I don't recognize any of these uh, four. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. <laughs> well, this is why it's interesting because hey, we're gonna learn something new. All right, and the last one again, number four is, and the stars falling cold, and the smell of hay in the snow, and the far owl warning among the folds, and the frozen hold flocked with the sheep, white smoke of the farmhouse cowl, and the river river wended way of vales where the tale was told. Uh, this doesn't ring any bells along the lines of what Tolkien. Yeah, Tolkien doesn't have a lot of poetry, and yeah. I mean that isn't interlineated in his in his works. And I know right. I know those well enough to know that the, these aren't that. And I will say so, it's definitely not from Tolkien's Noel poem, which he wrote in 1996. <laughs> An excellent which poem. Which was a video, and we came out. We put that out last week as our um, uh, as the podcast. If I had to pick one, I'm just going to say I, I'm going to go with with number three here. Um, that to me feels the most like it could be from something Tolkien wrote, but I'm not 100% certain by any stretch of the imagination. What about you, Dan? Uh, total shot in the dark. I'm just going to go three. Okay. I would have been with you guys, but I have been rereading things and the tales from the perilous realms. I just reread and, and I do know, I did recognize one of these quotes from that, which is from farmer Giles of ham. It's the first one and it does not sound like Tolkien. So I'm pretty sure that's from farmer Giles of ham because I just reread it. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure given the context too, That's fine. but I would have gone with three. I would have gone with three. Farmer Giles of ham before, um, before the fellowship, I believe, but not before Hobbit. But I don't know. He wrote it in nineteen thirty-seven. Yeah, right after Hobbit was published. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, all right. So, so um, let's. That's that, that's. I, I believe I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. Uh, the other three, I don't know. Not. But I would have gone with three uh, if I hadn't just reread yeah, that because because yeah. it's not his usual style. All right. So I'm gonna reveal here in our Discord chat what Lynn said. She said, "Here are our answers." All right. Number one, yes, Farmer Giles of Ham, you wow. are correct. Oh, interesting. <laughs> and number what? two is White Fang by Jack London. Oh, this so here. so it literally was a non-human. <laughs> it was a dog. It was a dog. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Number I three. I so I will. So there, this is kind of cool. Number three is actually from Hood by Stephen R. Lawhead. Uh, oh, who certainly was influenced by Tolkien quite a bit. Wow. So, yeah. Um, so good on him that we thought what he wrote was actually Tolkien. And we're, it's something that we'll bring up a little bit later in the episode, too. What, what's happening with Stephen Lawhead and his, um, his Pendragon cycle. So hmm. and then number four is Winter's Tale by Dylan Thomas. Oh, Dylan Thomas. Oh, do not go gentle into that good night. Oh, that mm, Dylan yes. Thomas. Right. Uh-huh. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Yeah. Yep, I've never yep, heard yep. of this one though. Yeah. I haven't heard of this one either. All right. Hmm. There you go. Thanks Lynn. That was, uh, that was hard, but as usual, Michael gets it right. <laughs> <laughs> I got lucky on that one. I would, I would have got gone with you guys if yeah. I hadn't reread it. Yeah. All it right. is interesting how, how even the same author, you know, we Tolkien's just, I've read him so much, but he's, my my sense of what Tolkien is is influenced by by his right. his final works, his later works of, of the yeah. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and right. so when I see an earlier version, it doesn't strike me quite as Tolkien um, like as right. The well, rest. I, well, it's in the same way as if you read the Silmarillion. Mm. Um, like I had a friend who read the Silmarillion, Silmarillion first. Was this and, the Silmarillion Virgin that yes, you were yeah, talking the whole about? Tolkien Virgin. He hadn't read that yet, but he read the Silmarillion first. And then stopped when he, after a Calabeth, didn't read of the Rings of Power in the Third Age um, because he wanted to read, read The Hobbit next. And then he read The Hobbit. And the stylistic difference between The Silmarillion and The Hobbit is pretty dramatic, too. Uh, exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just reading those, it doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, I know Tolkien's style. It's not like reading like Poe or something like that where you're like, oh, no, 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 that sounds like Poe. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, I mean. Cool. Well, thank so, you, Lynn, for that. All right. So let's move on to Chapter 17, the second half of The Coming of Men into the west dan we're going to start with you as is our want with dan's big thought all right so i think last week when we were introduced to the men that are coming over the mountains and and coming into the west uh, i think we were introduced to them or at least in my big thought was that they were like seeking the light and that they were trying to flee from the darkness 
And in this chapter, we find out that not all of them are, uh, shall we say, faithful. It seems like there is a lot of discontent and there a lot of distrust of the elves. And so we're introduced to, I think Tolkien says, uh, the leaders of discontent. And we have Bereg of the House of Beor and Amlak of Marak. And they're openly talking about how they need to, and don't listen to the elves. They're, they're playing you too. You know, let, let's just ignore them. We're not going to help them. So it's kind of interesting to me that you're introduced to this, this splintering of, of even the men that come over. They're not, they're not a united front. And then I think what happens next is pretty interesting where uh, they have like this big council of like, what should they do? Should they join the elves? Should they go south? Should they go west? And you have this whole narrative of Amlok. But like Amlok gets up and, and he's talking about, you know, there's no light in the west. You, you're, fo- you're following the fool fire of the elves to the end of the world. And then which of you have ever seen the least of the gods or who, who has beheld the dark king of the north? And he's basically like this whole narrative that the elves are giving you. It's all BS. Just don't don't listen to them. And then it's interesting that they end the council and then Amlok comes back and he's like, wait a minute. I didn't say that. <laughs> so you have like this really interesting uh Maybe, maybe Sauron, maybe. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I really enjoyed that part of this chapter. Yeah, that's. Do you? Does it strike you as the elves, as the men being similar to the elves in this division, this kind of division, or different from the elves as a first reader? I think it's similar because I think even the even the chapter itself says that this is kind of like the work of Morgoth that he has planted these uh, seeds of discord. Mm -hmm. And it seems like he kind of got to them first and was kind of like, you know, weaving in these these lies of you can't trust these people because, you know, they're actually against you. Um, They're actually lying to you. Um, It's it's interesting. It's 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 it it seems like his his primary tactic uh, 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 is to keep the forces of good or potentially good to be disunited and always fighting against each other. The whole idea that he comes around and says, well, I didn't say that. Well, what do you mean? I don't, I don't talk about anything. What are you talking about? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it speaks a little bit to the elves' distrust or some of the elves' distrust of the men, too, that if this is the kind of character that they have at their first sort of council of sorts, um, uh, and I guess no el- elf friends were there. Were they there? So elf friends were there. So, But were any elves there? I don't believe so. This is the council on assembly. doesn't men. seem like it, no. Yeah. But uh, that immediately he'd be like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I meant. I'm, I'm sorry if you were offended by my words, right? That's, the, <laughs> that's kind of his approach. So did, do, you, do you think he was just say, saying that? Because I, I don't think it was Amlok. I think it was someone in the guise of Amlok. Because it says specifically, but there arose one who seemed to all to be oh. Amlok, some of Imlok, speaking fell words that shook the hearts of all who heard him. Now, that's not the way one would usually describe it. Tolkien's, Tolkien's never I used it. That. And, nice and then, catch. And then immediately following, he says, his word, his, what he says Amlok does is interesting. He says, um, yeah. Amok returned among them and denied that he had been present at the debate or had spoken such words as they reported, and there was doubt and bewilderment. Now, that's not the usual way of denying, like, I've never heard anyone say, no, I wasn't there at all. You, whoever you saw, it wasn't me. Like, that's that's an impossible mistake to See, make. What's interesting, though, is he says later that um, I have now have a quarrel of my own with, with the Master of Lies, which will last to my life's ends. But right before that, he says he repented saying, which means that it almost sounds like almost he, he did say it. So Almost that's... except that I think what he's repenting thereof. Um, was his lead, being a leader of discontent. It says the leaders of discontent were Beric of the House of Beor and oh. Amlok, one of the grandsons of Marak. Yeah. And they said openly, so Amlok has prior to this council, he's, he said, we took long roads desiring to escape the perils of Middle Earth and of dark things. You know, they make the pitch for discontent. So he's a leader of discontent. He's named as one of the two leaders. And then, and then there's this council at which somebody who Tolkien says explicitly looks like him, which is a very weird thing to say, never in the, Someone only that we ever heard someone say, and then someone who looked like Manwe said, yeah. I guess one time we saw it was Mandos, the Doom of Mandos. It says someone who's who looked like Mandos appears. Um, and so, or something similar. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I don't think it's actually him, especially because he's he goes and gives his life to the elves, um, uh, to Mithros, and, and I it just doesn't seem like yeah. that. Yeah, that re- I, th- I think. I think... Re- 
the repenting is of, of his leadership and the discontent. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Though it's interesting that he doesn't, Tolkien doesn't make it clear. It's not like he comes out and says it. He leaves it up for discussion, which... This is very Tolkien-esque, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which, which, which allows us to have a much better podcast. Uh, <laughs> that's right that's no yeah it is it is interesting i wonder if omlock once he heard what he supposedly said probably was thinking like you know that's a step too far like because <laughs> he basically says like let the orcs have the realm that is theirs and we will have ours there's room if the eldar will just let us be and i, I wonder if like omlock's like i didn't say that that sounds a little too extreme that's that's <laughs> that's not me R Right. Well, and I and I do think there are clues that it actually isn't him because it yeah. says that he spoke fell words that shook the hearts of all who heard him. Now you can you can say that someone gives a powerful speech that ends up being fell words that shake the hearts, but there's something much more powerful than the normal speech about that. And then immediately after the paragraph that we were just reading about Amlock's repentance of whatever he repented of, the it says. Um, during this time, the Haladin remained in Thargelion and were content, but Morgoth, seeing that by lies and dece deceits he could not yet wholly estrange elves and men, was filled with wrath, wrath, blah, blah, blah. So it's almost referencing that he was the one that orchestrated that, that, um, that whole uh, dissension, and it gives more credence in my mind to the fact that the, the, the being, whoever it was that was speaking at that council that looked like Omlok was not in fact Omlok. Yeah. Might have even been Sauron, since Sauron could take many mm -hmm. guises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would. Yeah, if I'm, if you're trying to nail me down on that, I would agree with you on that. After uh, looking at this again, but yeah, it's so funny because if you don't read it with that careful eye, I like, I think you totally miss it, and I did, mm. I did. If that's the case, is this the first mention of Sauron so far in the Cimmerillion? Oh, that's just a guess on my part. I have no idea who it is. We don't. I don't I, it's clearly. I don't think it's clearly. I think it's most likely a servant of Sauron. Of, um, of uh, Morgoth, but because we know that Sauron can take many forms, and clearly whoever did this could take the form of someone else, um, you know, Sauron hasn't reached the point where he's locked into his final form um, like his master is. So Morgoth, we're told, mm. is is locked in, but Sauron is not yet. And so as a Maiar, he can take the form of, of, um, of he can take different forms at his will. So yeah. so mm. that's the only reason I, I, I suggested it. But I think we had Sauron mentioned before, did we not? Yeah, yeah. I... the first time he's mentioned in the, let's see, in the Quinta, no, in the, the initial, um, the Vala Quinta, among the, uh, those of his servants of Melkor that have names the greatest was the spirit whom the Eldar called Sauron or Gurthaur the Cruel. But anyway, um, it was certainly likely of him, like that's what, that's what Sauron would do. He would sow lies and deceit and discord among those. As it does well. seem to have those hallmarks, yeah. No, I was kind of hoping that Michael came up like he had that helpful, uh, you know, flow chart of like, here's all the uh, dark elves. Here's all the, the elves that went to Valinor. Here's all the elves that tarried. Here's all their houses. Here's all their family names. <laughs> so I, I did get a little lost in this chapter with I, I, I kind of picked up that there were three houses uh, that become the Adain, which are the, the elf friends. Right. And you have like Bayor was the, is a big house you have uh, or he's the he's the, the leader. Then you have the, is it the Haladin, um, the, the, which become the people of Halith, as we mm -hmm. find out. And then you also have one other one. Um, so you have the house of the people of Baor, mm -hmm. then you have the Haladin, mm -hmm. and then you have the, the men who are ruled by Maroc. Okay. So there are three different peoples. Um, the, the people of Baor are the first ones encountered. And, and they're the ones that uh, uh, Finrod Felagun befriends first. And then Beor himself um, wasn't even, his name was Balan, as we're told later on, which sounds to me like an afterthought by Tolkien. He's like, yeah, this guy <laughs> that I've been talking about, but, uh, his real name was uh, Balan. Yeah, that's it, Balan. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, Balan or Beor. Anyway, his people are the ones that have, seem to have the most friendship with the elves. Uh, and then, and they split up. Um, in the in the second half of the chapter into different pieces, but they're still one people. So this is the people of Beor. Then there's the Haladin, who are a different people. They're sundered in speech. Um, uh, Beor says, and the Haladin, a people from whom we are sundered in speech, are still in the valleys on the eastern slopes awaiting the tidings, before, our tidings before they venture further, further. So they're still on the other side of the Blue Mountains waiting to see what happens. And the Haladin, who we have a, an interlude from in this second half of the chapter, um, 
and uh, a very, you know, surprisingly non-patriarchal vision by Tolkien. I'm, I'm being sarcastic when I say yes. that. Like, it's the patriarchy all over again, right? Even though Tolkien keeps showing us heroic women, nevertheless, it's, he's a member of the patriarchy. So, anyway, the, the Haladin are the second people. The third people are the people um, who are different. Um, Beor says, there are yet other men whose tongue is more like to ours. So, in other words, still different, but more similar to ours with whom we have had dealings at times. They were before us on the westward march, but we passed them, for they are a numerous people, and yet keep together and move slowly, being all ruled by one chieftain whom they call Maroc. Mm -hmm. So so the people of Maroc, the, the, then there's the Haladin, who don't have a single leader, as we're told, but they have a, they're like, they're like a bunch of American colonists. They, they, they strike me as like, a, you know, they, they live out on their homesteads, and they, they don't really have that many, you know, they don't have great leaders, um, uh, except in need, but they sort of all live on their own and um, are loosely tied by language and region mm -hmm. to each other. And then there's the people of Beor who are the elf friends primarily, although we have just read about di dissension in the house of Beor. It kind of seems like the men that came over the mountains, they were kind of told or they believed if we just get over the mountains, we will find mm -hmm. the light. And you see immediately that they find elves instead and they go, well, this isn't the light that we were looking for. And, and they, they, you kind of see that, that distance between the elves and the men, that the men, the, I think the men still hold it against the elves. Like, you, you guys don't have the same problems that we do. You know, you guys don't die like we do. You, you, kind of start, you see the beginnings of that dissension, I think. And that dissension and the misunderstanding and trying to understand each other, I think Tolkien makes a point of at the very end of the chapter, um, when Beor dies, I believe it's Beor, if I remember yet, yeah, he, relinquished, he, he relinquished his life willingly and passed in peace, and the Eldar wondered much at the strange fate of men, for in all their lore there was no account of it, and its end was hidden from them. Mm. And the distrust, because they are so different, right? The, I don't think, like, it's like the elves can't understand why men would die and why they would die willingly at that age, because there's not, like, to them, like, they're still, in, in the first age, they're still in the relative youth, right, compared to where we know they will end up going, like the, the, the grief of living hasn't completely overtaken them yet. And so they see him die and it's like, whoa, 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 what? Yeah. Like they're just gone now? Where do they go? What happens? There's no halls? Like, and so that, but then the other thing that the, this part of the chapter starts with um, is where Tolkien writes that um, when many men remained in Estelad, they're still a mingled, mingled, peeper, mingled people, um, but he says they feared the Eldar and the light of their eyes, mm -hmm. which is interesting because the light of their eyes, I would think that is a reference to Valinor and the light of the trees and what, where they come from initially, unless I'm misreading that in, in some way. But, um, but is it the light of their eyes? Is it the same thing that they might have seen in the emissaries of Sauron or what Sauron was or something like that where he was, you know, sowing discontent and things like that? I'm, I'm just curious to say like, what, why, why, why did they fear the Eldar in the light of their eyes? Hmm. Well, to me, it gave a, a Moses in the Old Testament vibe, right? Just because there's, a, there, there's the light of God doesn't mean it's, fit, it's easy to look upon. And so, so I, I don't think that, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying the elves' faces were lit so that you couldn't look at them the way Moses' face was in the tent, um, coming out of the tent. But what I mean is, someone's face can you know there's an interesting line in the last part of the chapter that says nonetheless the adain of old learned swiftly of the eldar all such art and knowledge as they could receive and their sons increased in wisdom and skill until they fall far surpassed all others of mankind who dwelt still east of the mountains and had not seen the eldar nor looked upon the faces that had beheld the light of valinor so there's something about the light of valinor that's still in the faces of the eldar mm -hmm. and and it's a light of wisdom and art knowledge that the men can learn from but it's but they're not entirely comfortable with it either so, you know the men are different from the eldar and there's something otherworldly and i think we talked our last our last uh, podcast we talked about how different especially the noldor are who have who lived in valinor and how you know the, the men have seen elves before right because there were right. elves there's green elves to, to the east of the mountains mm -hmm. and and then they'd seen the elves green elves of osirian as well 
But these Eldar are different, and there's something about them in, in power, in knowledge, in art. The men can learn from them, but they're also, that difference has to be felt even more keenly. So the men do something which we hadn't heard about them doing before, which is they put themselves, some men put themselves in the service of the elves, right? They go and serve the elves and learn from them, but they mm -hmm. spend time in their courts. And so the men are clearly awed by the elves in some way. At least that's the way I read it. Yeah. Um, and the, and it's the light of Valinor that's in their eyes. But that light of Valinor can be scary, too. It's not it's not just a, um, a warm and comforting thing, and especially in the Noldor who have in them a, themselves a darkness. Right. And, and it's that fear that that Tolkien makes the point of that causes the dissension. So, yeah, but it, but it but it's also that fear that um, that made them. Hmm. He writes uh, the dissensions awoke among the Adain in which the shadow of Morgoth made it be discerned. So maybe it's it's reading too much into it. But the shadow of Morgoth and the light of their eyes, there's some sort of a relationship. I mean, I guess the dissensions are that, but they their dissensions awoke because they feared the Eldar in the light of their eyes. At least, uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm going that's too at least hard part of it. that, yeah. but that's at least part of it, yeah. It's really interesting to me. They, they come over the mountain because they heard there's light in the west, and they, they come over the mountain, and yes. they, they, they see it. It's, hey, it's you guys. And then they, and they're like resentful a little bit. Like, oh, we wanted the light for ourselves. We wanted to be free of pain and death and have light. And, oh, I guess it's you, not well, us. There, well, there was one part in this chapter, I can't remember if it was, where they actually made reference, one of them made reference to the fact that the elves have told them that they can't go to the to the Valar. They can't go yeah. keep going west. Yeah, they say that like that. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. This, is, this is the end of the road is the sense that I got. I can't remember where that quote was. Yeah, it's uh, the, the, the leaders uh, of discontent, that paragraph where he says, we cannot come to where the gods dwell in bliss. Mm. Uh, we learn that the light is beyond the sea. Uh so, yeah, but, but basically yeah. it's like, you know, we can't we can't go there. So now and the, we're and the elves here. aren't lying to them. They're right. telling them the truth. It's yeah. it, you know, they, they can't go to the to Valinor. And so but I think you're right, Dan, that there has to be some bitterness, especially since now, finally, finally, after much ado, we have in front of us in the Silmarillion a race with whom we can totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> Valar, Maiar and Eldar are not the kind of beings that we are. So. I can mm -hmm. easily see how that would create a kind of, you know, if they, they're seeking after this light, both as a reprieve from the darkness, which is chasing them, as well as for its own sake, probably, because light is a thing worth having. Um, then, and now they're told, nope, end of the road, can't go any further. Right. This is it. And uh, we're fighting Morgoth, by the way, the guy that's been torturing you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> we got him up here in these mountains. Don't worry. Perfectly safe. We got yeah, him, yeah, we got yeah. him so halfway here, surrounded. Here's the funny thing about that. Like, it occurred to me in, in looking at this and then in looking, um, in looking at the map, too, that the places that they gave him weren't, weren't were, um, that they had the uh, Eldar sort of, uh, or not the Eldar, had the men settle initially. It was Ladros over here. Right there. And then you have uh, Dor Loman over here. And I'm like, oh, so you gave them those areas that were relatively close to Morgoth. So, <laughs> so your job, men, you die early. It's no problem. You just be the foot soldiers. Yeah. You'll be, the, um, you'll be the, the chattel that'll be destroyed once, we, once, once Morgoth comes out of here. I mean, and I guess we had Brethel down here. So that's, that's their south, at least, of Arid Gorgoroth. And... Well, and there are still some men that dwell in Thargelion and Estelad, too. So. True, but it's not the realms that they gave them, I think. And what did Carinthir offer? Um, uh, now I don't have that up. Carinthir offered um, Haleth uh, land too. Right. Where's I don't Haleth? remember. Haleth. Carinthir looked this. kindly upon Haleth, a man, and the, ha did Haleth a great honor, and he offered her recompense for her father and brother. And seeing over late what valor there was in, their, in the Yadain, he said to her, If you will remove and dwell again further north, <laughs> there you shall have the friendship and protection of the elders. You are so good at own. holding out against Morgoth. Why don't you hold out up here, closer yeah, right. to him? That's, I don't know. It struck me as funny. And I don't, I don't think that's a complete accident. But um, Oh, it's uh, not. No, yeah. he's clear. He, I mean, look, this is one of the sons of Feanor. He's clearly using them. Um, and he's like, oh, wait, you can actually hold out against the... Like, which is interesting because they can hold out and the 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 Holodine do in a way that we're given to understand that, for example, the green elves can't. So the yeah. the the you know the green elves are just laid waste every time, um, if they unless they have the protection of Melian, they're laid waste every time the Morgoth forces come against them directly. Only the Noldor 
can sweep Morgoth's forces from the field. Um, and then the, um, some of the, some of the Sindar can hold against Morgoth, you know, in places like Kyrdan's, um, coastal fortress mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, communities, but, but they can't, but the green elves get wiped. So the fact that the Noldor are looking at the men are like, Oh, you mean you can hold out against more? Oh, well, have I got a place for you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Come on up. Ah, mountains of terror <laughs> that's don't right worry yeah. about those things Let's, come on that was that was frank back in the day he was just a scared kid yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that struck me as funny um <clears throat> is there so most a lot of this chapter is spent on halith and or part this part of the chapter right halith and and uh and her her leading of the haladin and how right because of how she led them they decided Instead, to not be called the Haladin anymore, but the House of Halith. Um, is that is that that am, that's how I read it at least? Is that they essentially were like, no, 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 she's the one that led us over here. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's funny that uh, that in today's world, the only like this is I, I guess you could, this is the str- the first um, female leader of men that we see in Tolkien's Middle Earth. Right? This is uh, there, there. I don't believe there's anybody else before her. I can't think of anybody, but that, that, you know, she, her brother dies in battle defending her. And then she, in her strength, takes her people and guides them to, I believe it's the forest of Brethel, right? Into Brethel, um, uh, through much, um, pain and destruction and death and survives there. And so, and for those just real quick, Jonathan, for those that are, can't see the visual, if they're just mm-hmm. listening to the podcast, Brethel is this little arm of the forest to the northwest of Doriath, the big forest with that Melian um, right. encompasses with her girdle. So it's um, technically claimed by King Fingal, but he kind of doesn't do much. Of it. It's not covered by the girdle of Melian, so he just kind of... Um, yeah, right, right. And so so it's... it's, right, it's them. I, I like that at least we have this character that Tolkien writes as a... I hate using the word strong woman because I feel like it's just been <laughs> used so poorly, but she's a, she's a leader of people, right? She's a leader of men and women, and yet the re- representation of a strong woman that we get is a good sword fighter, right? That's that's all we get ultimately, with um, with today's sensibilities in Hollywood, and it makes me sad because having a character like this, which clearly she was probably well versed in fighting and defending, but that's not all she did, um, and that wasn't why what made her strong. It was because she held her people together. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And t- to quote one line from there. But there were many who loved the Lady Haleth and wished to go whither she would and dwell under her rule. And these she led into the forest of Brethel between Tiglin and Syrian. Thither in the evil days that followed, many of her scattered folk returned. So, in other words, the the, the test of a good, uh, of a true leader is that the people love you and want to follow you. And the character of the strong woman as much mocked in today's culture is not one that anyone wants to follow. Or in other words, yeah. they can, you know, a writer can write in that people follow them in a particular storyline. But when but everyone's reaction when they listen to the words and watch the actions is nobody wants to actually follow them. They're not yeah. they're not actually likable. They're they're not a ruler, um, not not by nature. Whereas Haleth is. So favorite word from this chapter? Favorite word. All right. Yep. Favorite word Dan, or phrase. Dan, word or phrase. Dan read it, read mine. I was going to bring it oh, up. Yeah. What was uh, that? Which one was that? Fool fire. What is a fool fire? <laughs> so, so this is from, this is from the <laughs> creature. Like maybe I'm going to go with Sauron. That was, that was pretending to be, um, that was pretending to be, uh, Amlok. Amlok. Mm-hmm. He, he, so he said, you have followed a fool fire of the elves to the end of the world. <laughs> and I thought, like, wh- what is that? We've never seen anything like it. What's a fool fire? It, I don't know. It sounds like something that would come from um, an old English poem, right? The initial hmm. alliteration of fool fire. It just yeah. has that sort of like strength to it. But I yeah, have no idea. I, I'm fire. with you on that. Yeah. Hmm. But anyways, cool, cool word. And I, knowing Tolkien, I'm sure there was plenty of history behind that word or phrase that he either invented or borrowed from some poetry somewhere. So I loved it. I like the... There's the that whole line that where where uh, um, the fake Amlock is speaking is is probably my favorite because it, it does... It, it, it I don't know, it just... the 
the way it um, relatively in a short way it encompasses how th- how the men feel about the elves, but it just amplifies it and makes it worse. It's kind of, you know, it's the it's the Trumpification of, <laughs> of, oh of the gosh. conservative side of things. <laughs> mm. uh, I don't know. That's what it stood out to me for. Aren't you all glad that we're not making this podcast political? <laughs> <laughs> So I do yeah. like uh, two other parts of this chapter. Um, when when they agree, when King Thingle goes, okay, uh, people of Haleth, you can stay in the forest of Brethel, but you just have to make sure that you guard the, the crossing there and make sure orcs don't come in. And uh, she replies, where are Haldad, my father, and Haldar, my brother? If the king of Doriath fears a friendship between Haleth and those who have devoured her kin, then the thoughts of the Eldar are strange to men. I thought that was a, I thought that was a good reply. That there's there's this element that they just don't quite understand or trust each other. Like, do you think I would just let the orcs come in, or like, what what, what do you think I am? You know. <laughs> right, right. And then I also liked uh, that. I think you read it earlier uh, when Bayor finally re- relinquishes his life. The Eldar wondered much at the strange fate of men, for in all their lore there was no account of it, and it was and its end was hidden from them. And I thought that was. It was interesting that that there's something that even the elves are wondering. Yeah, yeah, and they never quite understand it. Like, right, it, it, it's never resolved in the histories of Middle Earth. Well, and interestingly, right before that one you that you read, it said something else about them. It says they grieve they grieved greatly for the loss of their friends. So to yeah. them, it's a sorrow. It's 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 not just a well that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it's, it was real. It's a real, a real sorry. <laughs> you, just, you, you can imagine a comedic rendition of this where BR is like 93 years old and he's walking along and talking to the elven on and just boom, falls over. <laughs> wow. That was weird. And the elf's like, wow, that was weird. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, similarly in comedy. But it is, it is that line right before where he says the elder saw for the first time, the swift waning of the life of men, you know, they've mm-hmm. been alive for thousands of years and, in 70, 80 years, these guys died. And even then, he, he died at 93, I think it was. And, yes. uh, and, and they're like, wow, that was short. Oh, my gosh. Oh, mm-hmm. no. So when we become friends, somebody's going to die. And, and then somebody wrote, I believe it was one of the Eldar wrote, uh, tis better to have loved and lost than ever. <laughs> yeah, it all. But, um, <laughs> Sounds like an Eldar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe the one thing we didn't bring up so far in this episode is these couple paragraphs before that where it's the... Um, it's the book of numbers in this chapter. It's the, it's the, it's the <laughs> where, who's where, what's what, and how do they look? And it's sort of hard to get over that unless you're taking notes through it, which I didn't do. But we talk about, you know, how we eventually get to uh, even the kings of Numenor, yeah, Baron and Luthien, Turin, like who are, who are all the descendants? But what was more interesting, I thought, was when um, uh, he, Tolkien writes that the men of the three houses throve and multiplied, but greatest among them was the house of Hador, golden head, peer, of elven lords right he wasn't just like he, he wasn't just serving them but he was the peer of them um and that they you know then they talk about how they were for the most part blue-eyed and yellow-haired but not turin because his mother was a house of morin more her mother was morwen of the house of Beor, and he had black hair and brown hair and gray eyes and that oh my, oh my gosh i can't remember all this here <laughs> so anyway if you can, yeah. if you got through that good on you but don't don't feel like you have to remember all of it because uh, the characters are more important, I think, than whether they had gray eyes or black hair. Although that's right, important. But, but to be clear, so this is the people that move slowly, the third people. So that's that's where Hodor is from. Hodor is from the people of Malak. So these are the people that move slowly and have a single leader. So they're not the fierce, independent right. people, Halifor. um the Haladin led by the strong woman. Um and they're not Baor of uh, of the of the first of the elf friends. Um, tribe. They're from, they're they're the uh, the 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 race of Aryans. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Oh, um, man. The the blonde hair, blue eyed elves. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, men. Mm. Blonde hair, blue eyed men. So. The bl- they're blonde, blue eyed, and militaristic. They all follow mm-hmm. one leader. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> sounds <laughs> sounds fascist, fascist oh my God, Jason stop, to stop, me. Stop, stop, stop. We're going to get beat down on YouTube or something oh, like man. this. No. Whatever. This, this chapter did make me think, just to switch gears here, it did make me think how we measure our lives. Like we think, oh, I've got, if I'm lucky or if, you know, if I play my cards right, I got maybe 70, 80 years. And you kind of have like milestones for yourself. Like by the time I'm 20, by the time I'm 30, what, where, where will I be? What will I be doing? how you measure success or, or failure. And it's interesting to me, it really hit me for the first time. The elves in this chapter have no concept mm. of that. No, they, they, they're, they literally live forever. And then when they see like that their best friend just dies at 93 and they go like, oh crap. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, we've, we've had yeah. instances and will in the future where elves are like, they get bored of being around each other and they go and they leave for 50 years and they come back and they're like, and it's, it's like nothing has happened. It's just right. like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I just, I just wandered off to this forest, you know, I lived here for 50 years and you know, what are you going to do by the time you're 30? Well, I'll, I'll have a nice carving of something. I'll have carved something nice <laughs> by the time I'm 30. Um, so yeah, yeah. they're, they're live. They're, the, the whole time span thing is totally. I've um, never quite thought about it in crazy. those distinct terms though, Dan, that um, our life is defined by, uh, moments, I don't know, moments of reckoning where you're like, okay, what have I done? And right. I haven't done enough because I'm running out of time. And then with the, with the elves, if you live forever, like you never have that moment. You'll never think like, what have I done? Because there's always more time to do it. So what have I done? Have I, done <laughs> I often, I often think to myself, have I, have I had enough children? I might need some more children. <laughs> <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. I think uh, everybody is not asking that question when they meet you. <laughs> you I'm just, it's just bannable, Michael, if you on, the, even on the did podcast the work. tonight. <laughs> 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 Look, hey, man, I did some of the work. <laughs> final thoughts, any final thoughts on this chapter before we uh, close it down and, and move on to chapter 18 next week? No. Uh, this is, I like the introduction to Min. I like how their first introduction is basically by contrast to elves. So mm -hmm. Tolkien is actually making a nice transition in my mind here, because of course the story of the ages of Middle Earth is going to become more a story of Min than of elves. Um, and so I see this chapter as a transition point where we're being shown not just the meaning of the Min, but shown some of the major differences between them and the elves, their relationship with them, and our frame of reference is transitioning from Eldar to a Dane. Yeah. So I like it. Yeah. Although in the very next chapter, we don't even um, get into uh, men. Much. No, no. Yeah. We're <laughs> going to, we're going to leave the men behind while yeah. my, while my boy goes down, my, my favorite, my bestie yeah. in middle earth goes, yeah. bites the bullet. But yeah. uh, so, so, but speaking of, of being a parent of nine, Michael did take the time this week, it being finally being Christmas on the 25th so that Michael could celebrate and decorate his tree. And the 12 days of Christmas are here until Epiphany. <laughs> we have the letter that to, taking, uh, you know, um, thankfully these are not published because I'm sure the Tolkien estate would be after you. But <laughs> Michael, as Father Christmas, writes letters to his children uh, and goes all out. Right. If you all remember, um, maybe you remember from, or maybe it was it in our subscriber section. Anyway, we, I thought we did a, if you like Tolkien and Jonathan, you showed the letters to fra of, fa uh, from Father Christmas mm -hmm. that are Tolkien's letters that he would write for, he wrote for many years. So I, we mentioned in that part that we have a tradition. So in my house, we read, um, some or all, depending on the year and how much time we spend of those letters to the kids before Christmas. So these are the letters Tolkien wrote. And he had been Tolkien, of course, it wasn't just a, I got, you know, Father Christmas is writing and he got your requests and, you know, a few comments. But of course, he begins to start making up a whole world in the North Pole that Father Christmas inhabits, along with his friends and enemies and frenemies and everything else. Um, and all of the so what we do at Christmas time also is the kids also they write letters to Father Christmas and then Father Christmas responds on Christmas morning. So mm -hmm. um, and then uh, for those that have read the letters from Father Christmas uh, by Tolkien, the uh, polar bear, who is uh, basically like the um, comedy sidekick of Father Christmas uh, in the stories, also makes an appearance. So so um, in Father of Christmas's shaky hands, the children might um <laughs> Uh, they receive a a uh, response in a series of pages from Father Christmas That's and awesome. and Polar Bear, and then one of my daughters does. That's the last one. And one of my daughters does a um, a painting or picture every time. In this case, 
the painting or picture this year is of the destruction of Father um, Christmas's sleigh by a, glo- a goblin, because yes, Tolkien has goblins in the North Pole too. <laughs> and uh, so, and the, the subsequent uh, um, crisis that ensues, which took place in my letters. And of course, at the end, because I know this has been roundly mocked by my fellow po- podcast hosts, but, <laughs> but one of my sons decided to write his letter to Father Christmas this year entirely in Tengwar. So Father Christmas responded in Tangwar at the bottom as well. Oh man! Um, to to my son Aiden, who uh, how old is Aiden? Aiden is nine. Nine. Does he does he believe in in Father Christmas? Um, it's a good question. You know, like Tolkien, what we do is 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 one of those things. I know there's there's always there's this debate that people perennially have is like, should you tell your kids that? that Santa Claus exists or Father Christmas or whatever mm-hmm. the purpose is. And because we shouldn't be lying to them is the argument against it is you shouldn't be lying to your kids. Um, my view of such stories is that um, the world is not bipolar in the way people try to make it out where there's only truth and lies. So myth and fairy story occupy a place which teaches deeper truths and which some of the details may not be factual in the sense that we think of a, you know, a, a things existing in the physical world entirely um my kids so we try to inculcate an environment where mystery wonder um and magic are a kind of thing which you know obviously we're a christian family but they're a kind of thing which which produces a desire in the kids to to you know sort of partake in this thing hence my daughter who now paints these pictures for her younger siblings and such um and so so uh, we've never asked a single one of them, do you believe in Father Christmas or do you believe in St. Nicholas or Santa Claus? Um, We just talk about, well, St. Nicholas was a real Mm -hmm. person. He was a Christian bishop. Um, And and some of the traditions of gift giving come from apocryphal, probably apocryphal, but somewhat maybe uh, stories about him. But anyway, so they they learn about that and, and they learn about what the spirit of Christmas is. But um, but we don't ask them that kind of direct question because I don't think it's, I don't think that's important. I mean, obviously most of them know, probably maybe all of them know, actually maybe my youngest doesn't, but that there isn't actually a fat man that comes down our chimney, um, and puts gifts, but, um, but they, but they like the, the mystery and the magic, yeah. um, and the wonder of it. Right. All right. So, um, so that was Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy Merry New Christmas. Year. Um, and as we get into... If you like Tolkien. Uh, the one thing that I want to bring up is uh, earlier this year, wh- uh, like it or dislike it, hate it or love it, um, the Daily Wire uh, bought the rights to Stephen R. Lawhead's Pendragon Cycle to make an actual live action series from his books. So these are a series of books that he wrote, I think, in the early 90s, I want to say the first came out, or late 80s. Late eighties, early uh, yeah. late eighties to ninety. I, I started reading them when I was in high school, and then I continued yeah, through college. Here. They kept they kept coming out until I was out of college. So it really started off as three: uh, Taliesin, who is I believe the father of Merlin, uh, Taliesin, Merlin, and Arthur. And then there was a fifth one, um, a fourth a one four, called Pendragon a, and, a and Grail, one, Grail, and then Avalon, which is sort of like a blog almost or a, a, like it's it, it doesn't it doesn't fall within the same same time frame ultimately as uh, right right as the first five but they got all the rights to these so for all the complaints that we have of how you have to hold a certain mindset in order to make something like the rings of power because checking check boxes is more important than staying true to the real story because uh, i feel like if if there was an arthur film to be made or an arthur series to be made um you know there wouldn't be an Arthur, there'd be like an, an Annette or something like that, right? Because that would be what we'd have to have. Uh, or there wouldn't be a, a Merlin, there'd be a M- Meryl. So. <laughs> um, well done, sir. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> or a so, Zeril. Or Zeril. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So I'm hoping like we'll see something that's in more of a, you know, the fairy fantastic tradition without it being done by um, the machine that has hmm. there, right? The, the, the message that they have to get out won't be the, the driving force behind a series like this, right? We saw it with Wheel of Time. We've seen it with the Rings of Power. Um, hopefully we won't see it with this. I really like these stories. I haven't read them in 30 years. So I, I will sit down and read these in the night before, 
before the series comes out and maybe that's something that we can take actually we should do that too. because because i would like to reread these i i haven't read these in many many yeah. decades so yeah. and i read these pretty soon after I, I read the lord of the rings in seventh grade and i think i probably read these in like eighth or ninth grade um mm -hmm. which was uh you know i would have been 14 at the time 15 um yeah so it's gonna so, be it's gonna be really interesting in my mind because if I was going to put something in a nutshell as, as far as where rings of power went wrong and what the whole, in, in, from a philosophical perspective, it's that, and where, for example, even though he made changes and some of which I disagreed with, um, Peter Jackson did not go wrong, generally speaking, in his, in his making of the movies, was that his intent, as stated by him baldly, was to f figure out what was the story that Tolkien had written and what did he have to put on cinema to make that story live? And whereas the Rings of Power suffered from a lack of a cohesive story, or at least um, they didn't have a script to follow the way that Lord of the Rings did, um, the way that Peter Jackson did with Lord of the Rings films. And so they invented their own story. Mm -hmm. and, and and as as often quoted, the, the story that Tolkien never told. Hmm. And so they put themselves on his level and they had to invent a story. And then when they invented a story, of course, they put into that story all the things that were in their heart. And might I say, I prefer Tolkien's heart far more than mm -hmm. Amazon's heart, well Harm, Amazon showrunners. Well so so I, it'll be interesting to reread Lawhead's trilogy and see whether I feel like the source material would stand up to being just directly translated or do you have to adapt it somehow i mean you always have to adapt for the screen in some yeah, respects yeah. but how much how much um can we just put it straight onto the screen and and we'll be interested to see whether the daily wire does that or not but yeah counterpoint uh, mm -hmm. this all sounds great with the pen dragon thing but did you know that season two of rings of power <laughs> will have all female directors <laughs> No, I did because there was a Torque Daily video about that actually. Yes. Just, you I'm know just what? Saying, that's a selling point, look, right? There's there's something going for that because <laughs> I think I smelt some influence from some masculine directors in the last season. So oh, it's gosh. probably this is they're, well, they're probably so on the right track. Here is my point with that and the thing that I did like the, the it's it's not necessarily that they're they're that like first of all, you should never the, the way somebody looks whether it's physical or biological, right, or the hair color, right, none of that really matters to the quality of the of the piece that they're putting out. But if they're given crap content, which clearly there was in the Greens of Power, like the writing was bad, the world was poorly constructed, everything was off. They, they can't do anything good with it. No matter you can you can't give that kind of a, a script to Steven Spielberg and make anything that's going to be like great anyway. So they're kind of being set up to take a fall, even like so. So so what they know is maybe they know they're going to have really bad content, and so they can simply say like, if you don't like this, it's because you're a misogynist. I don't know. I hope not. I hope right. Not. But they'll continue to do that anyway. Check out Stephen Lawhead. Um, Stephen Lawhead's uh, he's a he, he is a really good author and actually that goes back into the uh, all that is gold does not glitter that that um, musician that I mentioned who I like Jeff Johnson some of his music was inspired by Stephen Lawhead's uh, following trilogy from this called the Song of Albion that he wrote I believe in the mid to late 90s um, and so maybe we'll get him to score this I doubt it but that'd be fun so there you go check out uh, the Pendragon cycle there'll be a link below to a couple of the books that you can get on Amazon so that was a long one again, guys, but thank you everybody for joining us. We will be on to chapter 18 of The Ruin of Beleriand and the Fall, fall of Fingolfin. I'm not sure if we'll get through all of it next week. We'll try. We'll see. It's, is it a longer chapter? I think it is. Uh, it's a, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's we'll a see. longer chapter. We'll see. Um, so we'll, we'll go through that, read that for next week. I think it's uh, doable. And, uh, and we're off. We're off into the extended podcast. So all y'all head to thewondering.com slash patron to, uh, to join us in this conversation because we're going to kick you out right about now.